Seems a little cool in here. I think I was just reflecting, I think you could hang meat in this room. Uh, rather, rather cold. <laughs> but it's just perhaps, perhaps just me. Anyway, uh, please proceed. <laughs> no, no, I feel very warm toward you, and I don't even know. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bob McIntyre, and I'm director of Citizens for Tax Justice. I've been doing this business for 34 or 35 years now. Uh, I mention that not so much to explain why I'm so old and gray and decrepit, but just to let you know that I came into this before President Reagan uh, allegedly taught some people that deficits don't matter. Uh, we always thought they did because tax fairness to us also means that you don't borrow the money from the future and put it on uh, the next generation, but that you pay for it now. So we've been longtime deficit hawks and we're glad to see that this commission is working on it too. Now I assume when all the dust clears that the results from the commission will include both revenue increases and tax reductions. Uh, and I'm only going to talk about the, excuse me, tax increases. Um, and uh, I'm only going to talk about taxes because that's the only damn thing I know about. What you do on the spending side is up to you. And here's what we think you ought to do on the tax side. Income taxes, the tax that we know and love, sort of, is the part of the tax system that we need to fix. It's a mess. We haven't had a real reform of it since 1986. The barnacles have gotten very deep, and it doesn't raise enough revenues to pay for the government. In general, we think you need to get the personal income tax back, back up to about 10% of the economy, and the corporate tax back up to about 3 or 4% of the economy as compared to the 7 or so percent that the in Personal Income Act tax is now and the 2% that the corporate income tax is now. Now, how do you do that? Well, part of it would be to get rid of more of the Bush tax cuts than President Obama has been willing to uh, address. He's suggested keeping 80% of those Bush tax cuts, which are a big part of our deficit problem, and it's going to cost $3.5 trillion over the next decade if he does keep them all. He's got a rule that says nobody under $250,000 should ever pay a nickel more in tax. I think that's way too high a level, and we've got to get people like me involved in helping pay for this government a little more, too. The second and more important part, or as important, is we need to close the loopholes that have grown into the tax code over the last 25 years. And you need to focus on what I think is the gross undertaxation of capital income. Now, I say that, and you may be shocked to hear it. I don't know. Um, a friend of mine who used to run the Joint Tax Committee said to me uh, recently, he said, you know, the economists all seem to think that we way overtax capital income, and the tax lawyers know that we hardly tax it at all. Well, I'm, I'm a lawyer. <clears throat> and, you know, if you look at what's going on with profits, the U.S. profits being shifted offshore, a depreciation system that in conjunction with uh, interest deductions produces negative tax rates on virtually every real capital investment in this country. Uh, what we have left in the corporate income tax right now is mostly just the government's return on the tax subsidies that it provided to these investments. There's really hardly anything left because the rates are n generally negative on most investments. The offshore situation is a mess. Uh, I would mention going to territorial would make it even more of a mess as uh, President Bush's uh, tax commission, which endorsed territorial, admitted. Uh, we, we get a bonus out of the loophole closing reform besides raising revenue. It'll probably help the economy because we won't have the government telling businesses what to invest in. We'll have markets and consumer demand deciding those things, and that's the way it ought to be. Uh, and that's the way we did it in 1986 under President Reagan and Bob Packwood and Dan Rostenkowski. Uh, see what a bipartisan guy I am? And finally, one thing, a value-added tax, don't do it. It's incredibly complicated, it's incredibly regressive, and it does nothing for us on trade. And if you wanted to read my story about why that's true, that and other things you can find on our webpage at ctj.org. Thanks a lot. I see you're still disarming people with your humor, hanging around. I got that from you. Yeah, no, you're better at it. You always were. Good afternoon, Chairman Simpson and members of the Fiscal Commission. My name is Julio. 
I'm the president of the Coalition for Health Funding and senior director of government affairs of Mental Health America. I'm pleased to offer this statement on behalf of the coalition to inform your policy recommendations on reducing the federal deficit. Since 1970, the coalition has advocated for sufficient and sustained discretionary funding for the U.S. Public Health Service, including NIH, CDC, HRSA, SAMHSA, ARC, FDA, and the Indian Health Service. That's quite a public health team. Our diverse membership of over 60 national organizations represents the funding priorities of over 100 million patients, healthcare providers, public health professionals, and scientists, nearly a third of our population. We support the belief that funding for the public health service is essential for improving health and health care through greater access, higher quality, lower costs, improved safety, faster cures, and ultimately healthier people. Costly and often preventable chronic conditions like asthma, diabetes, heart disease, and obesity, particularly among our young people, are on the rise and threaten our military readiness, our academic achievement, and our social societal productivity. And we are just one flu pandemic or biological attack away from a disaster of monumental proportions. The coalition's pressing and immediate goals are to build the capacity of our public health system to address these and other health needs and to support the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. In this regard, we urge you to consider opportunities to both reduce federal spending and also raise federal revenue. In particular, you should look beyond non-defense discretionary spending, which represents less than half of all discretionary spending as the principal vehicle for deficit reduction. We believe recent efforts in Congress and the administration to cut non-security -discretion, non discretionary spending are short-sighted. They just won't reach your goal. Such efforts disproportionately restrict funding for critical public health programs, weaken our ability to respond to a health crisis, and immeasurably harm America's most vulnerable who rely on the federal government to provide basic and necessary services, particularly in these times of economic hardship. Furthermore, such efforts will not substantially reduce the deficit nor make a dent in the national deficit. A non-defense discretionary pro pro discretionary programs comprise only 20% of all federal spending. Indeed, the real costs of these cuts far outweigh the perceived fiscal benefits. The public health infrastructure is continually asked to do more with less. On average, federal investment in the agencies of public health service has increased by only 2.5% per year over the last five years, and many agencies' budgets have increased at a much slower rate, well below the rates of inflation and population growth. The erosion in the public health continuum is felt in communities across America, with states eliminating hundreds of millions of dollars in public health programs and reducing their workforces by 15%. These cuts have left communities around the country struggling to deliver basic prevention and emergency health preparedness services at a time when the public health infrastructure is already buckling under the weight of ongoing recession, an aging population, no one here in this room is included in that, raising rates of chronic disease and behavioral health conditions, and a health workforce shortage. A non-defense discretionary spending freeze would have a devastating effect on the health of our nation and seriously hinder the impact of the Affordable Care Act. Only with increased investment in public health can we build capacity to transform our health system from one that reacts when people are sick to one that proactively keeps people healthy. That's the best way to truly bend the cost curve and reduce the, the federal deficit. We hope you will consider the social costs of discretionary spending cuts and the value of public health programs in reducing health care costs and improving the lives of American families. We look forward to working with you. Thank you. And I apologize to you and to my fellow uh, panel members, but I have an, uh, an airplane to catch that I'm perilously, perilously close to missing. So I, I want to excuse myself. I'm only hoping to make a nine o'clock flight tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Simpson and Bowles, members of the committee and uh, staff. Uh, thank you for your patient attention. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to share the views of member organizations of the Coalition on Human Needs. My name is Deborah Weinstein. I'm executive director of the Coalition on Human Needs. 
Uh, I have uh, peppered you in the middle of the night with copies of a letter signed by 119 national organizations, which I am submitting as part of this testimony. And thank you for it. <laughs> thank you for noticing it. Uh, the letter asks you to make the commitment that your recommendations to reduce the deficit will not make low and moderate income people worse off. We ask this out of an urgent concern about our nation's future. The service providers, faith groups, and others who signed this letter all report the painful impact of the recession. Economists tell us that if we had the official poverty statistics for this year, they would show that more than one in four of our children is living in poverty. There is ample research to show that children growing up in poverty are more likely to have poor nutrition, become sick, be hospitalized, move frequently, fall behind in school, and drop out of school than children who are not poor. In multiple ways, poverty places roadblocks to opportunity. We cannot afford to close doors to millions of our children and youth and expect our future security and prosperity to be assured. Neither can we afford to deepen poverty for the unemployed, people with disabilities or retirees. That will increase government costs and shrink consumer spending. Your commission, your commission's mission is not concerned with today's crisis but you must determine whether your recommendations will set in stone policies that deny opportunities to those currently left out of whatever glimmerings of recovery we are now experiencing. If your recommendations prevent adequate investments in nutrition, public health, education, youth employment, and rebuilding low-income communities, today's children and young workers will be more likely to drop out of school with reduced job prospects and productivity. Today, 25% of our youth drop out of school. We should be investing to reduce that number and to increase the number of students who complete post-secondary programs. We do not dispute that there are serious choices ahead of us, but we do dispute that the choices inevitably must hurt the poor and vulnerable. In an analysis by the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, the Bush era tax cuts and spending on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan alone will add $7 trillion in deficit spending from 2009 through 2019. Since 2001, Tax cuts account for almost half of deficit growth. Military uh, spending is responsible for another 35%. The Commission should direct much of its attention to fair and adequate revenues and wasteful military spending. When faced as we are with a prolonged period of unemployment and rising uh, Poverty, it is vital that we know whether proposals will make conditions worse. We urge you to find out whether the proposals you make will make conditions worse. It will be tempting for you to simply call for percentage cuts in certain types of spending, but if you recommend spending cuts without coming to grips with what those cuts will mean, it will almost certainly result in a further reduction in support for education, for job training, work supports like child care and public transit. These cuts will assuredly make low and moderate income people worse off. The Commission ought to play a leadership role in turning away from these grave missteps. As the later letter states, an explicit goal to protect the most vulnerable in our nation, together with impact analyses to ensure the goal is being met, will assist the Commission in producing recommendations that can put the nation on a sustainable fiscal course without harm to those who have no margin to sacrifice more. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to present the views of the Committee for Education Funding, or CEF. I'm Joel Packer, Executive Director of CEF, which is the nation's oldest and largest.
we come before you today with one simple message. Investments in education are critical for our long-term economic growth and our global competitiveness. Increased investments in education are also a moral imperative. Our nation continues to face unacceptable gaps in educational achievement and attainment at all levels. Student academic achievement, high school graduation, college attendance, and college completion. African Americans and Hispanics lag behind their white peers in all of these categories, as do low-income students and students with disabilities. As an example, looking at fourth grade reading, in 2009, only 15% of African American students scored at the proficient or higher level, as did only 16% of Hispanic students, compared to 41% of white students. While, only, while about 70% of students earn their high school diploma, among minority students, only 58% of Hispanic, 53% of African American, and 49% of American Indian and Alaskan Native students do so. Lower levels of educational attainment directly translate into lower levels of earnings, lower levels of tax payments, and increased levels of government spending on social service programs. Looking at the impact of education and unemployment, individuals with less than a high school diploma had an unemployment rate three times that of those with a bachelor's or higher degree. Yet the fastest growing segments of our population are from these very racial and ethnic groups who are still being left behind. Between 2006 and 2020, the white population is projected to decline by 6%, while African Americans will increase by 10% and Hispanics by 33%. Our failure to close these educational gaps threatens not only the future of tens of millions of children from these groups, but also threatens our long-term economic outlook and our global competitiveness. At the same time that we must address these achievement gaps, our schools and colleges also face record levels of enrollments with increases projected throughout the decade. Making matters even more challenging, the educational attainment level required for jobs continues to rise. Estimates are that by 2018, nearly two-thirds of all jobs in the United States will require some form of post-secondary education or training. We are also losing our edge in the global knowledge economy. America's high school graduation rate, once the best in the world, now ranks 18th among industrialized countries, and our share of the world's college students has dropped from 30% in 1970 to less than half that today. Investments in education directly increase earnings and thus revenues. It's estimated that over the course of their working life, a bachelor's degree recipient will earn nearly $1 million more than an individual who only has a high school diploma. Research has also demonstrated that if we close achievement gaps, revenues and GDP will significantly increase. If the number of high school dropouts was cut in half, the government could reap $45 billion via extra tax revenues and reduced cost of social service program spending. If we had closed the gap between our educational achievement levels and those of better performing nations, GDP in 2008 could have been between $1.3 trillion to $2.3 trillion higher. However, despite, uh, in spite of these facts, the share of federal budget devoted to education is less than 3% of all federal outlays. CEF supports increasing this share of federal spending to 5% of outlays. Solving our nation's fiscal situation and reducing the debt can't and won't happen simply by cutting federal spending, capping discretionary spending, and freezing education. Investments in education are investments in our fiscal future and our societal well-being. When what earns is increasingly linked to what one learns, when the global leadership of the U.S. is threatened by other countries outperforming us on education, and when the need to close our education gaps is greater than ever, education deserves to and indeed must become a larger share of the federal budget. Thank you. It's kind of interesting. In, in this year, if you look at the NAEP scores uh, and take a, a little city-state like Singapore, 44% of their eighth graders scored at the most advanced level in math and science. In North Carolina, less than 34% of our kids were even proficient, much less at the most advanced level, and less than 14% of our low-income kids were. Right. And if you think about what happens to those eighth graders, for every 100 eighth graders, 58 graduate from high school, 38 go to college, 28 come back for the second year, and 18 graduate. That is a formula for failure in a knowledge-based global economy. Said it better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> sure, 
but uh, anyway, thank you very much. It's very helpful for us. I mean that. We, we learn. Go forth and multiply. <laughs> thank you. Hey, thanks for coming. Yes, now the next group, if you will come forward and, as I say, get comfortable and then tell us your name and the group you represent. And uh, we're probably about the halfway mark here. He thinks he's going to get out of here at 9 o'clock. He's crazy as hell. No. <laughs> no, I didn't mean that. Well, thank you. Uh, and thank you to the commission members who stayed. Uh, David Cote has just left. Uh, Ann Fudge, uh, you're very, and Kent Conrad was here, and Andy Stern, uh, we appreciate that very much. You're very, very helpful. So, go right ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman Simpson, Chairman Bowles, uh, members of the commission, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing and to share a perspective regarding our nation's fiscal circumstances. My name is Rob Nichols. I'm the president of the Financial Services Forum. It's a nonpartisan financial and economic policy organization comprised of the chief executive officers of 19 of the largest and most diversified financial institutions that have business operations here in the United States. Our nation's fisc fiscal condition, which as you know, has deteriorated appreciably since the onset of the recent financial crisis, represents perhaps the single greatest threat to financial stability, our nation's standard of living, and the productive vitality of the U.S. economy over the long term, longer term. With that in mind, the importance of your charge to identify and recommend policies to improve our nation's fiscal situation in the medium term and achieve fiscal sustainability over the long term cannot be overstated. We thank each and every one of you for your service to this critically important effort. Given the large volume of speakers today, I'm sure others will ably outline different proposals to fix uh, the situation um, and the deterioration of our fiscal situation. Instead, I thought I would very briefly touch on the risks of inaction to our financial markets. Failure to meaningfully address the nation's fiscal circumstances entails a number of financial dangers that could significantly impact the productive vitality and job-creating capacity of the U.S. economy. Principal among these is the risk that global investors could become increasingly worried about America's debt position and begin demanding higher risk premia to continue purchasing U.S. government debt. At current elevated levels of debt, rising interest rates could quickly compound an already challenging debt situation, adding further to the nation's debt burden, increasing investor anxiety, leading to an even higher interest rates, and touching off a vicious circle of deterioration often referred to as the debt trap. Moreover, given that Treasury bills and bonds are the basis for borrowing structures in private credit markets, the impact of rising government debt rates on the cost of capital, economic growth, and job creation would be far-reaching and decidedly negative. Given the likely impact of higher rates on U.S. economic prospects, another risk associated with further deterioration in the nation's debt position is that investors may become increasingly reluctant to hold dollar-denominated assets. As investors increasingly choose foreign investment opportunities, the relative value of the dollar would fall, undermining America's purchasing power and our standard of living. A falling dollar, of course, also has da dangerous implications for inflation. Finally, given the likely impact of higher interest rates, slower growth, and a falling dollar on asset prices and market confidence, further deterioration in the nation's debt position would likely be associated with greater financial market instability. History teaches us that sharp reversals in market confidence occur abruptly, often with little, if any, advanced warning. Greece is but the most recent example of this historical pattern. Because broader circumstances, not to mention global markets' reaction to them, cannot be predicted or anticipated with any kind of certainty, prudence strongly suggests that the U.S. act decisively long before a crisis becomes a realistic possibility. Thanks very much for the opportunity to participate before the Commission today, and more, more importantly, thank you very much for your service to our nation. We're extremely fortunate to have your leadership. Thank you. Chairman Simpson, Chairman Bowles, and distinguished members of the Commission. My name is Donna Meltzer, and I currently serve as the Chair of the Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities, or CCD. CCD's members are organizations that represent the needs of people living with disabilities and their families. We conduct our work through a variety of task forces, banding together to advocate for public policy that will positively affect people with disabilities. I appreciate the opportunity today to share some of our collective thoughts with you 
and have submitted a longer version in writing. Sound federal fiscal policy is critical to ensuring adequate resources to support programs that promote the independence and productivity of children and adults with disabilities in the United States. Unfortunately, federal resources for these vital programs has been eroding over the past decade. The result of this lack of investment is that more, not fewer children are deprived of all of the best in a free, appropriate public education. More, not fewer people with disabilities find it hard to get and keep gainful employment. More, not fewer families are financially devastated by the lack of assistance with excessive health care expenses for their family member with a disability. And more, not fewer communities are diminished by the lack of inclusion of and participation from some of their most valuable citizens, those with disabilities. CCD supports working toward a strong economy. This can be accomplished if federal funding decisions and tax policy do not result in a federal budget that is crafted at the expense of people with disabilities. Services, supports, and benefits critical to the well-being of people with disabilities and their families are protected, improved, and expanded. And when needed, the federal government leads or assists states in being fair and efficient in carrying out their responsibilities to people with disabilities and their families. Reductions in entitlement and discretionary spending threaten health care and quality of life for people with disabilities. Medicaid policy changes, as well as changes at the state level, could adversely affect our constituents, eliminating critically needed services and supports. Since our most vulnerable constituencies who receive supports, their futures are inextricably linked to any shift in Medicaid policy. Certain changes to our Social Security system also could have a devastating impact on beneficiaries and on human services funding. There are three areas in which the disability community is most focused right now, employment, health, and long-term services and supports. By addressing the need to employ people with disabilities, providing health care, and addressing the fact that people with disabilities may need long-term care for many years, we can begin to eliminate some of the fiscal burden we currently know. Recent enactment of the Affordable Care Act puts into place a number of health and long-term care programs that we believe will, over time, yield significant positive results and reduce the current burden on the Medicaid program. We strongly caution that these programs be allowed to materialize before considering any further cuts to critical health and long-term care programs. Subsequently, there are many discretionary programs in addition to entitlement programs that result in helping people with disabilities find employment and equally, if not more importantly, keep their employment. Incentives to work and an eventual end to poverty or underemployment should be encouraged. CCD it urges the Commission to consider some of the following. The failure of our nation, states, and communities to honor the civil rights of individuals of all ages with disabilities is a cost we cannot afford. We need to address the significant unmet needs of people with disabilities and their families by increasing existing federal funding and expanding the federal government's investment in people with disabilities to enable them to live and work as independently as possible in the community with appropriate, flexible, long-term and individual and family supports this will result in creating taxpayers and fewer who are needing help. Most importantly, what I'd like to say today is that I'm a mom. I'm the parent of a 13-year-old son who lives with three different diagnoses that he battles with each day. I hope that together, on behalf of my son and the millions like him, we are able to create a country with a sound fiscal situation that provides supports in school, supports at work, good health care, and a community that is caring and supportive of all of our people. On behalf of CCD, we look forward to working with all of you as you continue to do your very difficult task. Thank you for what you're doing. Good afternoon, members of the commission. Uh, my name is Joe Guggenheim. I'm from Bethesda, Maryland. I'm just an individual citizen, uh, and now I'm mostly retired. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm Joe Guggenheim of Bethesda, Maryland. I'm now mostly a retired business person and publisher in the interest of full disclosure, I have to admit that, in fact, in my earlier years, I was once an economist. <laughs> Thank you so very much uh, for giving individuals like myself a chance to talk to you on these critical issues that you're facing. I urge the Commission to help to achieve long-term fiscal balance primarily by emphasizing a vigorous policy of promoting economic growth and full employment. Moving toward balanced budgets in the short term or medium term is not nearly as important as full employment and the economic well-being of all Americans. To increase our anemic current rate of economic growth, we need targeted public investment that should probably include major spending on critically needed infrastructure, 
education at all levels and job training, and helping to revitalize distressed communities by providing training and jobs for the unemployed residents of these areas. The Commission should also play a critical role in dampening the outcry against any more fiscal stimulus now, which we need to bring down excessive unemployment. In the long run, a high growth economy can produce enough tax revenue to meet our national needs when combined with prudent measures to raise revenues and reduce questionable spending. As a society, I believe we can sustain national debt as a higher percentage of our total economic output. I believe we really do not know the difference between a potential impact of national debt of 50% of GDP as composed to the impact of national debt of 100% of GDP. For more than 50 years, I have read the predictions of the forthcoming ruination of our nation because we were not balancing the federal budget. I am still waiting to hear exactly how the economic and social well-being of our citizens has suffered over these 50 years of budget deficits because of the budget deficits. As a prosperous society, there is no reason that we cannot sustain current benefit levels of Social Security, Medicare, and other entitlement and needed social spending. The focus of budget policies in these areas should be on cutting costs rather than reducing benefit levels. Better balancing of our budgets can also be achieved through substantial reductions in military spending, ending our two wars, eliminating tax loopholes and, and unnecessary tax expenditures, taxing capital gains at the same rate as regular income, substantially increasing IRS efforts to audit tax returns and if necessary, increases in income tax rates for upper middle income and wealthy individuals. Because our nation is facing stagnation and low growth in the size of the labor force, a long-term solution might also include substantially liberalized immigration policies to attract skilled and, and, and are motivated immigrant workers who would reduce the ratio of retired persons to active workers, would contribute to economic growth, and would produce substantial increases in Social Security and, and Medicare tax receipts to help pay for entitlement programs. Highly developed European nations have used immigration to counter the impact of a stagnant population and labor force. Our own cities with large numbers of immigrants, such as Miami, New York, and Los Angeles, have prospered in recent years. For over 100 years, this nation prospered mightily as millions of hardworking immigrants looking for a better life flock to our shores. We can learn something from our past history in this area. In the year 2001, the 10-year budget outlook by the Congressional Budget Office envisioned substantial budget surpluses and the total elimination of our national debt. What's happened in the interim? That outlook in 2001 envisioned a higher rate of economic growth. Unfortunately, our situation is totally different today because of the two wars, the Bush era tax cuts, anemic economic growth, and a major recession. If this commission, because of time and personal constraints, is unable to fully investigate what policies are needed to promote full employment and rapid economic growth, you might recommend that another presidential commission be appointed to make recommendations on these vital issues. Thanks so much for listening to my ideas. You have a next group, please. If you'll just introduce yourself and, and start. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Dan Siciliano, and I'm a senior fellow with the Immigration Policy Center, part of the nonpartisan American Immigration Council. I am perhaps as importantly the faculty director of the Arthur and Tony Remby Rock Center for Corporate Governance at Stanford University and a member of the law school faculty where I teach venture capital finance and corporate finance. 
Uh, I think today uh, uh, you've received a lot of uh, technical information. We've also entered several technical reports into the record and some other uh, testimony, and it seems that you are bombarded with a lot of data, which I'll try not to add too much to, but rather perhaps provide in this limited amount of time uh, some uh, logical information that ties some of these pieces together with a focus particularly on immigration reform. And so the prior uh, witness was a good segue to what I hope to bring up. Um, I'm hoping to land in the sweet spot where intellect, I hope, uh, meets up with intuition. I'm going to suggest that comprehensive immigration reform must be a part of any sophisticated analysis or recommendation that comes from the Commission, in part because we know that immigration has a lot to do with innovation, business formation, and over time, uh, industrial and job formation. Um, first, I, I think it's the easiest case to make the connection between innovation, economic growth, and uh, skilled immigration. Andy Grove, uh, co-founder of Intel, uh, put it best when he suggests that each time one of the best and brightest from the globe arrives in the United States is kind enough to typically pay full tuition at a university, a uh, university like Stanford, oftentimes subsidized by their government, and then graduates with a technical or highly skilled degree that we seek, perhaps we should simply staple a green card to their diploma and hope that they stay and uh, return the favor of having already paid our universities, but also uh, form uh, companies that are great and prosperous and employ many people. Um, it, this analysis comes from uh, the Congressional Budget Office, from the Kauffman Foundation, the connection between highly skilled immigrants and uh, innovation and job growth is fairly clear. But let me tie that in a way which is a little bit harder to articulate and sometimes not obvious to comprehensive immigration reform and the 10 point 8 million people who are here in an undocumented fashion. Uh, so first, it's worth noting that the economic consensus has emerged fairly strongly in the last several years, led by work done by a labor economist named Giovanni Perry at UC Davis, and some of his work has entered into your record, that shows that the aggregate income of US-born workers, nine out of 10 times, is enhanced by the presence of all types of immigrants. And this has a lot to do with the fact that we know that the US sensitivity and positive signaling to the world about immigration causes those who have choices as skilled immigrants to decide to come to the United States in our graduate programs versus the other choices which they increasingly have in places like Singapore, Dubai, UK, and other places. And so how we treat and how we provide communities of all immigrants, including undocumented immigrants, uh, impacts their selection and their contribution to our economy in the future. But as importantly, um, perhaps the non-technical innovation and the small business formation and the general labor market dynamism that results from entrepreneurs generally, which are drawn from both the documented and undocumented population, is an important point for you. We know that significant components of our economic growth in the 90s came in part from a surge of legalized individuals who had been otherwise well disposed to entrepreneurialism and good at aggregating capital, but had not felt it easy to emerge fully into the integrated economy. We have that same scenario now, and so in turn, it turns out that immigrants of all types, skilled and unskilled, um, have a propensity for strategic and effective risk-taking, um, have a profile which is amenable uh, both to aspirations for themselves and their children that leads to job formation, and then in the end, perhaps as demonstrated in the 90s, are good at forming companies which generate jobs and in turn generate revenue. Um, a comprehensive immigration reform would jumpstart that capital formation and would allow that pent up capital, in part, to be unleashed. Uh, that and a normalization, perhaps going from in 2003 to now, uh, nine to more than $17 billion of enforcement, a normalization of that enforcement would also help equalize budget allocation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Bowles, Chairman Simpson, and members of the committee and staff. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Katie Robbins. I'm the national organization. I'm, I'm the national organizer of Healthcare Now, an organization founded in 2004 to support Bill HR 676, the National Healthcare Act, or expanded and improved Medicare for all. With membership in 50 states, Healthcare Now has broad support for single payer healthcare. Healthcare Now opposes any consideration of cutting privatizing or raising age eligibility for Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. We seek to strengthen, not weaken, our social safety net. 
If passed, H.R. 676 would establish a national single-payer Medicare for All system, granting everyone in the United States access to comprehensive, high-quality health care using our existing privately run infrastructure and a progressive financing to guarantee coverage for all necessary medical care without financial or other barriers. According to Harvard University studies, Eliminating the waste of the multi-payer private insurance industry in our healthcare system and moving to a single-payer system will save $400 billion a year. More savings are found in cost controls that only a single-payer system can provide, such as negotiating drug costs and medical equipment and global budgeting for hospitals. Since H.R. 676 was introduced in 2003, it has received tremendous support, including endorsements by 582 union organizations in 49 states, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, 63 local governments, including 10 of the nation's 30 largest cities, the Episcopal Church, the United Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Unitarian Universalist Church, the United Church of Christ, and the majority of nurses, patients, and physicians support this. Broad support for single-payer Medicare for All continues even after the new health law has passed. For example, this past Saturday, June 26, America Speaks, a privately run company, organized town hall meetings in 20 cities across the country to discuss the nation's deficit. America Speaks received funding from the Peter Peterson Foundation, the same foundation which I understand is funding staff to this fiscal commission. Peterson is known to be vocally in support of cutting and privatizing Social Security and Medicare. America Speaks claimed that all options would be considered, yet the materials distributed by the events did not include an option to support single-payer health care as a means of controlling health care costs. Despite efforts to silence support for single-payer, many participants at these meetings demanded the option to vote on a single-payer type health care system which would ultimately reduce costs by making healthcare more efficient rather than just cutting services in Medicare and other public sector programs. Participants also voted overwhelmingly for defense cuts and for progressive taxation. Because cost controls are notably absent from the new health law, the National Commission of Fiscal Responsibility should listen to what the public is urging them to do and address meaningful cost control in our healthcare system, <coughs> which only a single payer system can provide as a means to control the nation's deficit. We urge you to address cost controls immediately. Healthcare Now and our network of supporters urge Congress to work to defeat any bill to cut, privatize, or dismantle our social safety net, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. We continue to demand the enactment of an expanded and improved Medicare for All system to fix our economy and our still broken healthcare system. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Rob Duggar. I'm uh, speaking as an individual. I feel uh, actually quite uh, uh, disconnected from the other witnesses, but I draw kinship from a lot that others have said about the importance of human capital in getting this economy going again. I especially, uh, Chairman Bowles, your comments earlier about Singapore versus the United States and the NAEP scores. Uh, it may be that uh, it's Davidson and Chapel Hill and Duke and, and the School of Life at Lumberton, Fort Bragg in North Carolina that, that sort of teaches me these lessons. Could have learned them in Wyoming, uh, Co-Chairman Simpson, with wonderful August spent every year for the past 15 years in Jackson Hole. I'm Rob Duggar. I'm a founder and managing partner of Hanover Investment Group. We're a consulting firm that advises businesses, asset managers on how to navigate fiscal crises. I'm also the uh, vice chairman of the governing board of INET Economics, and I'm a co-founder of the Partnership for America's Economic Success. Obviously, uh, my testimony is my own. I don't represent the views of any of the entities I'm affiliated with. The essence of what I have to say today is this. Uh, the experiences of the last year, fiscal crises of the last year, have taught investors something extremely important. What they thought of as of something that could be put off or not worried about for many years actually affects asset prices today. The process is explained in my testimony, but let me tell you in a brief. When asset managers begin to calculate the present value of the tax increases and spending cuts necessary to bring about fiscal sustainability, they realize that these have an impact on company profits, 
when they calculate this present value and put it into company profits, it changes their valuation of a company's bonds and its stocks. Right now, as a consequence of the size of U.S. deficits, stocks and corporate bonds are weakening faster than Treasury bonds. Investors are doubting or having increased questions about whether this commission or Congress will be able to deal with deficits. And as a consequence, that they are discounting the value of U.S. corporate and uh, 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 corporate bonds and stocks, selling them off, and rotating into Treasury bonds. And Treasury bonds are, are improving in strength. The second thing that they have learned is that as they have seen strikes, demonstrations, significant cutbacks in spending and stress within other countries that are going through acute fiscal crises, they've realized that budget crises are not about money. They've realized that budget crises are civil. A budget is an architecture or a fabric of all the civil relationships, all the civil commitments we've made to each other. When we say we have a civil, when we say we have a budget crisis, what we're actually saying is that the fabric of civil commitments is being ripped apart. The most important thing that this committee can do, this commission can do, and it begins literally today, and so far I have to say my compliments to you on it, is to convey to American voters and, and, and investors in American assets that this commission is committed to the idea that the civil fabric of this country is going to be held together. Investors need three things from you, and they need it literally in every meeting. They need to have a sense from you that there is a, oops, I'm at the end of my time. Hmm? The, they need to have from you a sense that there is a set of principles that will guide budget decision making, a set of principles that make sense to families and businesses. They need to understand, they need to see in you the kinds of actions that halt the deterioration in civil unity in this country, and they need recommendations from you of year-by-year -year targets. This is particularly the investment community, year-by-year -year targets, and a framework that guarantees this time we will actually meet those commitments. And in this regard, a statutory commission is a very attractive option to investors. Uh, as far as that set of principles, I recommend to you the Partnership for America's Economic Success principles, put human capital first, invest in kids, transparency, performance evaluation, and sustainability. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Co-chairs and members of the commission, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. <clears throat> I have, have to acknowledge some admiration for your stamina. I, I know people who are coming in at 8 o'clock tonight to testify, so... Uh, I admire uh, your, your stamina. Uh, I'm Roger Hickey. I'm co-director of the Institute for America's Future. We support smart economic policies to reduce structural uh, deficits over time. However, I want to share three major concerns. One, we're in danger of killing or weakening needed growth in the name of reducing deficits. Our organization is a member of the Jobs for America Now Coalition, and we and many Americans want to warn you that uh, we are very concerned that premature deficit reduction uh, could undermine not only the fragile economic recovery, but the will to do additional stimulus, which is very, very important right now as the economy teeters on the edge. Uh, the focus on deficits is causing senators to fail to pass needed jobs bills, for example. Forecasters predict that official unemployment rates will remain well above 9% for several years into the future. This is simply unacceptable. Uh, we need new efforts to create jobs, stimulate the economy, and send aid to the states, and it's not happening. Uh, adopting spending cuts or tax increases prematurely will simply slow the recovery and undermine the tax revenues that we need uh, to balance the budget. Now, Number two, while deficits should be reduced over time, some deficit reduction strategies are misguided. My organization was the leader of Americans United for Social Security and Healthcare for America Now, uh, helped pass the health care reform uh, bill. And we know that deficits were caused primarily by 
the tax cuts, by the recession itself, by the military buildup, and more, most importantly, the growing health care costs uh, in the whole society. Unfortunately, many deficit hawks are, are fixated on, on cutting Social Security benefits and cutting Medicare and Medicaid benefits or capping them. Uh, we feel that those are mistaken. Social Security has nothing to do with our deficit problems. It is supported by its own dedicated payroll taxes. I would also suggest that this commission should really put Social Security aside. This is not the venue for discussing Social Security solvency since it does not contribute to the deficit and will not for decades, if ever. Uh, and uh, I would suggest that comments so far from members of the commission have undermined the faith that this commission could treat Social Security uh, effectively. Uh, it's a matter of trust. The growth in Medicare and Medicaid spending is a problem and one that is driven by rising health care costs. We need a structural reforms additionally, such as the public option that can give competition to private health insurers and requiring drug companies to compete uh, for lower prices. This kind of structural reform in the health care system, not simply cutting Medicare costs, which are symptoms of that larger health care problem. Uh, additional health care reform is, is the way to go. And finally, to achieve uh, fiscal balance, uh, we should not simply uh, reduce the deficit, but also we need to invest in the future. Uh, my organization is the founder of the Apollo Alliance for Green Jobs and, and New Energy. Uh, we applauded President Barack Obama when he ran and won on a program of investment, public investment that would stimulate new productive ind industries that would make our economy more energy efficient and the private sector grow as a result. Uh, we estimate that it's going to take billions and billions of dollars, uh, uh, $400 billion annually over the next five years uh, to really do the job. So my admonition to you, uh, don't just cut the deficit. Uh, we agree that once the recovery comes, the deficit needs to be reduced. However, uh, we need to grow the economy, reduce the deficit, and invest in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a next group, please.